There we go. It, it helps if you turn the microphones on. So let's try that again. Hello, and welcome Hello. to GM Chat <laughs> with Mike and Jeff. Oh, well, you know. Yeah. We're old. You'll get old once. Mm-hmm. Once. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I always, I've never forgotten that. Of everything else from that movie, that's the one thing I remember. My, you shot me. My mother shot me once. Once. <laughs> Johnny Dangerously. Michael Keaton reminds and Joe me, Piscopo. Hmm. Reminds me of an episode of MASH where uh, Colonel Flagg <laughs> is standing there and Frank Burns puts his arm around him and he says, my father touched me like that once. To this day, he still has to wear orthopedic shirts. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Well, uh, what we thought we'd talk about tonight, uh, we're, if you've watched the show uh, before, you know that we're big fans of Dungeons & Dragons. And we've been playing D&D &D since, like, first edition, like, advanced D&D. &D. And the one Before thing, then. <laughs> yeah, the the one thing that they have been able to do consistently throughout their history, no matter which company owned them, is put out adventures. Yes. Put out uh, in first and second edition, they were called modules, and then mm -hmm. they changed to adventures. Mm-hmm. Um, but regardless, it was. Uh, pre-made adventures that you could run your players through and so we and thought was, go ahead yeah it was also it was also a i mean for us uh early birds with the game was a sort of a blueprint on how to do it ourselves yes and make our own adventures so it was very helpful in that way as well yeah i've always been one that that i work better off some sort of template right and yeah, that was definitely, definitely our template. So, I we're going to talk about lots of lots of modules. Um, some of them have been ported to later editions. Some of them have not. Um, but we're just going to talk about the ones that we remember that were our favorites uh, to start. So, I've been I've been dying to know what's your favorite. So when you proposed this to me, this idea, I thought, oh, this should be easy and get it. It was not. Because <laughs> the more I started thinking about it, the more modules came to mind that I played through and the more I'm like, oh, oh, but, ah. Uh. And um, the criteria I sort of went to is what adventure module did I have the most fun playing in? And, um, I had to say, for me, it was uh, Undermountain. Oh, yeah. Because it was so huge, you know, you could play in it for ever, you know, um, which meant the more playing I did, the more fun I had. So it, it, that's probably the one I had the most fun in. Uh, however, a tight second, uh, because I'm a big sap at heart when it comes to nostalgia uh i have to put uh uh keep on the borderlands yeah. because that was the very first module that came in the box set of the uh basic rules yep and um so you know for being the very first module i ever played in and and having that sort of uh built up hyped up memory of that in my head that's that's a close second for that reason yep now for those of you who don't know uh keep on the borderlands was module b2 mm -hmm. they all had letter series and then numbers told you what chapter in that letter series it was mm -hmm. and uh going to wikipedia but uh the plot summary player characters begin by arriving at the keep and can base themselves there before investigating the series of caverns in the nearby hills teeming with monsters. These 
Caves of Chaos house multiple species of vicious humanoids. Plot twists include a treacherous priest within the keep, hungry lizard men in a nearby swamp, and a mad hermit in the wilderness. Come on, how much fun is that? <laughs> and it sort of established the idea of what we would all later come to call a dungeon crawl. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, and, you know, back in those days, um, being the uh, late teen that I was, uh, it was all about dungeon crawl and murder hobo, hack and slash, kill yes. loot and treasure. You know, it, it, that's what it was all about. It was all about the acquisition and, of wealth and power. Yes, yes. So you could go and kill more things faster and get more money and more powerful things. Yes. Yeah. Yep. All advancement. That's what it was about. <laughs> and those modules accommodated that. That so that was just probably the appeal of it, you know. Yep. Um, for me, and uh, anybody who knows me, this is not going to come as any surprise. My uh, absolute favorite series was the I series i3 4 and 5 which were better known as the dungeon of desolation modules it was all uh desert based adventures the first one mm. was uh you had to cross the desert and get into a particular pyramid and loot the uh the temple of amun ra Or excuse me, Amun Ray, yeah, mm. and uh, that for some reason was always my favorite. That was just so much fun for me. Um, and interestingly enough, doing the research for this, I think now I understand why, because it was written by Tracy and Laura Hickman. Ah. Uh who are the people who created the Dragonlance world. Right. And they're very good. So realizing that they wrote that, now I get it. Mm -hmm. But it just, it hooked me. And then there were two uh, modules that came afterwards. There was an I-4 and an I-5. I-4 was called The Lost Tomb of Martek. Or no, Lost. second one was uh, Oasis of the White Palm which was more desert and a lot more um, like outdoor in the desert adventures. And then mm -hmm. Lost Tomb of Martek was like a buried tomb in the desert. So it was right. more of a traditional so, dungeon crawl, but it still had that desert flavor to it. Yeah. So more of an outdoor survival. Yep. Type. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I actually, uh, a couple years ago, took about four months and I converted the first edition module to third because mm. I wanted to run it in my third edition campaign. And uh, I was telling Mike just before we started, I'm now considering that maybe I should try and convert it to fifth. Uh, if it hasn't already been done. I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it. Uh, Pharaoh's not uh, as popular with other people as it is with me, apparently. I mean, there are some people who like it, but it doesn't show up on a lot of the like top five or top ten module lists. Hmm. I think it's just me. Well, but, it would be interesting. But yeah, that was that that was pretty much my favorite, and uh, you know, it it had kind of a fun start to it too. You uh, basically came into this town on the edge of this desert, and you shacked up at an inn and. Woke up out in the desert surrounded by soldiers who accused you of a crime you didn't commit and told you that uh, you had been banished and you are sent off into the desert. Well. Yeah. And that's kind of an interesting way to start. It's kind of an, uh, uh, an oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the other one that 
that I have to say I have a soft spot in my heart for was uh, the progenitor of the Ravenloft campaign setting, and that was just the module of Castle Ravenloft. Right. And that was literally somebody took Dracula and said, let's make it a D&D module. Right. I'm... Complete with the gypsies and everything. Did you did you take us through that module? I think so. Okay. It it seems like I've played through it once, but I can't remember. It's been so long ago. Yep. Yeah. But the those are the ones that that really kind of stuck with me. But you know um, Well, there's a lot of them that stuck with me, but <laughs> uh you know, I, I really like the Giant series, the Giant modules. Those were really good, mm-hmm. a lot of fun. And um, when you actually – I had a, a, a GM back in the mid-'80s who took us through the G series and then the D series and then the Q module. So we went through the Giant series, which led into the Drow series – which led to, I think it was Queen of the Demon Pits. Hold on, I pulled this up. Yes, Q1 was Queen of the Demon Web Pits. And that's basically where you have to go into the uh, the abyssal realm of Lolf and fight her. Because, you know, why not? Well, you know... This was for, you know, first edition D&D, and it was for characters levels 10 to 14. And in first edition D&D, if you were 14th level, you could take on one of the lower gods. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's wild. Uh, That, (laughs) yeah, I guess, I don't don't know if I played through that one or not. Hmm. Yeah, it was, a, it was a long campaign, but it was a lot of fun. It was basically just, it was hack and slash all the way through the Giants. But then when you got to the Drow series, it got a little bit trickier because Drow or Trixie. Mm-hmm. And so that was fun. And yeah. then wandering into the Abyss, the 66th layer of the Abyss. <laughs> Well, at least it wasn't the 666th layer of abyss. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, it, thinking about it now, I don't. I think most of the modules I played through would have been in the 80s because once we once we kind of got the hang of it, we were kind of doing our own thing for a long time after that. Yeah. But yeah, I've got stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of old modules Mm -hmm. you know we ended up with groups that ended up writing adventures continuing adventures for like the the band of the burning ember and the um oh god what was it there was a frost based group too Mm. band of the white frost i think but, yeah, and, you know, so you'd start a campaign with these characters, and then the characters would sort of carve out a, a group identity, and then you right. just start writing more adventures for that group. Mm. I remember there was <laughs> there was one campaign that ran for about two, two and a half years that had uh, 15 players. Uh, yeah. Uh, that was that was back in undergrad. Yes. In the early '90s, and uh, it was me and another DM who would trade off. Um, he worked construction, so when construction season began, I would take over and run until construction season ended, and then he would <sighs> run all through the winters. And no thanks. Yeah. It was. I start getting uncomfortable when we hit seven. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like the smaller group for sure. Um, oh yes. But uh, it was an education running for that many people. I'll bet. And uh, 
actually, I'm trying to remember, I think the first summer that I ended up taking over, I that was when 3rd Edition had just come out with, like, the historical Forgotten Realms setting mm-hmm. back before... Uh, the fall of Mistra when there were still 10th and 11th level spells and the big, yeah, the yeah, big right, floating right. citadels and everything. Yep. And uh, boy, my players were not real happy when they woke up and none of their stuff was magical anymore and none of their spells worked. Well, things that make you swear. There was, I think, one cleric that could still get spells because their deity actually still existed just under a different name. Uh. (laughs) And so they kind of had to, you know, start figuring out the cosmology and how everything worked because it was a... It was a... Well, on one hand, it would really suck to not be able to do the things that you were doing the day before, but on the other hand... What kind of an interesting thing that would be you're sort of reinventing magic. Yeah. You know, that would be kind of cool, I think. Yeah. At least from a role-playing standpoint. The role players got into it. It was the the murder hobos who were like, what do you mean I can't just mow my way through stuff like I was doing? I'm right. like, well, you can. It's just going to be slower because none of your gear is magical anymore. Right. Yeah, that doesn't. No, they that there, doesn't uh, there fly was, very far. <laughs> there, there was a lot of there was a lot of grumbling, and I was like, "Just give it a chance." And what they ended up doing was all the stuff that didn't work anymore. They figured out a way to sort of store it, mm-hmm. and they just sort of carried it around with them. And when the other DM came back, well, gosh darn it, they found a way to get back to the present. And all their stuff worked again. And all the stuff they brought back with them didn't work anymore. Except for a couple things. Mm. You know, because the way magic worked in the land was different. Right. There was much less control by the gods. But that was kind of how we ended up having the... the the, the fall of the gods, the first fall of the gods was that uh, right. one of the one of the lead magic users in the world, Carsis, wow, I remember the name, um, <laughs> wrote a 12th level spell which allowed him to switch places with the god of magic. And oh. it worked and his mortal mind was incapable of handling the demands of the god of magic, and magic warped and kind of exploded. Yeah, that's a wizard for you. And when when Mistral figured it out and restored everything, he decided that yeah, we're going to limit these stupid mortals to no more than ninth level spells from now on. Right. <laughs> but there were some fun spells. I remember one of them in particular was called Elemental Swarm. And it was like an 11th level cleric spell, and it literally was summoning up a small army of all four kinds of basic elementals. Well, that'll cause some damage. Yes, and it did. Um, but yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, and we couldn't talk modules without, of course, mentioning the, the big bad. And that would be Tomb of Horrors. Oh, yes, of course. Gary Gygax's attempt to punish any player who ever tried to play it. Yes. Or as I like to call it, the Game Master's Gift. Yes. For having to put up with players and their shenanigans. Yeah. Our friend Buddy, who was here uh, with us a couple weeks ago, continues to maintain that he at some point wants to run our current group through Tomb of Horrors. 
Well, it'd be a good way to end the campaign. Yeah. Yeah, and he's like, no, it'll be fun. People would get a big kick out of it. I'm like, you are overestimating people's tolerance. Right. Of course, for those of us who know a little bit about it, it is a great way to get rid of those characters that have annoyed the living hell out of you. Which would explain maybe why he why he's trying to push it so much. <laughs> Be like, yes, at the end of the hallway, there's that great black portal. Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead and step through it. Nothing stopping you. Uh-huh. And nothing left of you after you have. That's the only thing. We're, we're so much more, I mean, you know, you and I both can certainly think of far worse things to do to players if we really wanted to sure to uh take them out but yeah sure so should we talk about the borrowed creative license we took from one module to completely devise a whole campaign setting for us. Uh, Bloodstone Keep. Oh, Lord's yes. <laughs> um, now I have to say I have to say this about that. I had already come up with my character, uh, who was a, a original advanced D and D unearthed arcana cavalier yep. class. Yep. And. Long before that module was ever made, I had come up with this character named Gareth Dragonsbane. And when that name appeared in that module, we thought, hmm, if they can steal my name, we can steal their city. Yep. <laughs> this and, we then did. Oh my gosh. That was that was so much fun. Because that was the first um, I think that was the first really high level module that we ever tried. Um, because that one, <laughs> first edition D and D, the level range was, and I kid you not, eighteen to a hundred. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anybody who had a hundredth level character. Still don't. No. Nope. But never made it that far. 18 to 100, uh, and what you had to do was basically uh, enter the abyss and defeat uh, uh, Orcus and steal his wand so you could come back and uh, use it to defeat the Witch King of Vasa and then go back to the abyss and destroy the the rod of Orcus or the wand of Orcus. No problemo. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> but yeah, we uh, the because we had already been playing with that character, uh, and we'd set it elsewhere in the Forgotten Realms. When that happened, we just kind of uh, retrofitted the campaign to be like, nope, this is where they're from. Yep. And oh gosh, look, it. It, it's time to go home. Right. And, and uh, yeah. we had a lot of fun with that afterward. Yep. And uh, we ended up doing another campaign, which was Descendants of those yes. characters. Yep. 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 Uh, Aaron Dragonsbane, he was... Uh, to give you a little background information about my characters and this, the kind of characters I played, um, never liked bards, never liked them, never played them. Aaron was a bard, but I wanted to make him different. He wasn't a singing bard. He was a stand-up comedian bard. <laughs> So a lot of fun was had with that character. Yep. And I'm trying to remember, was that 
Was that uh, when Rynan's disciple Akash? Yes. He was part of that group. I believe so, yeah. yeah. I had a, a, a character who, uh, same name as a character from Dragonlance that I was in love with, but not the same individual, just same name. And uh, he ended up actually becoming a, uh, like the, a, a lower level deity. Like, not great or not intermediate, but the bottom level. And assumed the domain of uh, uh, magical artifactory. So he was the god of uh, magical creation, creating mm. magic items and things like that. And yeah, my character was. Uh, <clears throat> we came up with a new class, which was Disciple of Rhinon, which was sort of a fusion of mage and cleric. Right. Not I suppose if you were to redo it in 5th edition, the sorcerer of the, um, what was it, the divine, what's it called? Uh, I can't think of what it's called now. It's like the divine soul or so. I can't remember now. But it, anyway, you basically get access to uh, cleric spells hmm. as a sorcerer. And uh, it that might translate well into something like that. Yep. Oh, you know, you shouldn't have said that. Now you're making me want to retrofit that <laughs> campaign for fifth. Interesting. <laughs> I have written up uh, Gareth in uh, fifth edition hmm. rules. So, but. Interesting. As a starting character, not as, as the level he ended oh, in. Oh, no, no. Um, another one that I really, really liked um, was the first time that they uh, really got into what would become in third edition Planescape. Um, it was a module called Tales of the Outer Plains, and it was a, a booklet which was a bunch of different adventures for different levels all in one book but they all took place off the prime material plane it was either in the right. astral plane or one of the elemental planes or you know some of the outer planes I but, think I remember that but I'm not sure yeah I was always fascinated by uh, by the planes I mean I always have been well um, Planescape was, was really interesting I never actually got an opportunity to play it but I have uh, seen some of other Monty Cook's inventions, and, and from what I understand, that one is really fun. Um, uh, do you remember the old, um, like the Baldur's Gate style games? Like the video games? Oh, yeah, 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 for sure. There is a Planescape video game. Really? Of that style, and it is absolutely, like 100% Planescape. Wow. It is yeah, very bizarre. That'd be fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking at the the table of contents for that, uh, Tales of the Outer Plains. There's one that's on the prime material plane, and then there's the ethereal plane, uh, the elemental planes of air, water, fire, earth, the astral plane, and then two of the good outer planes uh, and two of the evil outer planes they have something on right. on uh, in the seven heavens something on olympus then something in the abyss and something in the nine hells right so something for uh you know something for the demons and something for the devils but so have you have you been able to take a look at any of these newer adventures that uh, Wizards has come out with? Well, I I have the... Um, I have Out of the Abyss because I was actually running uh, you and several other people through that at one point. Um, and I picked up um, Dungeon of the Mad Mage because I, too, adore Undermountain. Mm -hmm. And that's the 5th edition port for that. <clears throat> but apart from that... Um, 
Well, no, I just mean the ones that have come out recently, that have been released recently by, by Wizards. I don't think so. Like, um, you know, the Waterdeep thing and uh, the most recent one they just came out with, which I have, by the way, uh, the Icewind Dale oh, adventure I, book. I read about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. The ones that they've got the big, like, full book um, uh, adventure modules. It, it has new content of all kinds in it and stuff. Hmm. Uh, the Icewind Dale, yeah, I just got just picked that one up, and uh, it's got just outrageous amounts of little adventures in it. And they all tie together if you want them to, and um, uh, it it just looks like a blast. It'd be a lot of fun, and it's the Icewind Dale setting. It's you know. Yeah, I always enjoyed that video game series too. Yes. Yes. The only thing I really remember about it is that David Odgen Styers did the narration for it. <laughs> um, wasn't that where, wasn't that where Minsk came from? No, that was Baldur's Gate. Oh, that was Baldur's Gate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, then I don't remember anything from the Icewind Dale yeah. games. I remember Minsk and his his giant miniature boo. space hamster Boo. Yes. I remember a mutual friend or a friend of mine that you know, Eric Cato. Um mm -hmm. When I was showing him that game, and in, when you opened up Minsk's inventory, Boo took up a slot, and if you clicked on him, it was literally somebody saying in a very high-pitched voice, Squeak! <laughs> and Eric thought that was the funniest thing he had ever seen. <laughs> Similar wits, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing that I'm waiting to see if they're going to do for 5th edition is Spelljammers. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, the first adventure that came out in 1990 was called Wild Space. And that was sort of the introduction to the idea that there was another way to travel between different prime material planes. Right. That you could literally do the fantasy version of space travel. Right. And uh, to a certain extent, that's where the propulsion for the clever sprite came from. Oh. Was the was the ba was the core idea of what a spell jamming helm was. Gotcha. Um. That's cool. Yeah, but it you know it just dawned on me that you know somebody who was very clever could literally create a rechargeable battery, a rechargeable magical <clears throat> battery, and that battery could run a motor. Right, power an engine. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, but that one, man. And um, what was it? There was um. And was this third? I guess it was. The Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil. Yes. I don't think I ever actually played the original Temple of Elemental Evil. But I knew about it. Yeah. It, yeah. Everybody knew it was, about it. Uh, yeah, it was along the same veins as Tomb of Horrors. <laughs> Well, not not okay. as bad. Uh, you could. Yeah, it certainly... wasn't. It wasn't. Well, it wasn't intended to be a TPK module, right? Uh, but it it was pretty. Uh, it was pretty heavy duty, though. <laughs> yeah, return was fun. <clears throat> I remember uh, taking a group through that, and uh, they had a lot of fun with it. Um, there was a lot of frustration because they would, you know, get to a place and they could not figure out the puzzle. Hmm. But, uh... Yeah, I hate puzzles. <laughs> I'm just I'm no good at them. I can't figure them out. I get, get really tired really quick. And I'm just like, all right, whatever, you know. 
If I was the barbarian, I'm like smash our way through it. But it's trapped. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I learned a long time ago that I don't write puzzles because what seems obvious to me doesn't end up being obvious to anyone else. Well, the other <laughs> issue I have with it is that it can really bog the game down. Now, it's it's great for those who are good at it and enjoy those kind of things, but that's, you know, maybe, you know, one person in your whole party that, that enjoys that kind of thing. Um, and so it, it just sort of slows down the whole thing. You know, everybody's trying to figure out how to figure out this puzzle, and it's like, you know. And like I said, I'm just not any good at it and have no patience for it. So I'm just like, smash through it. <laughs> yeah. I like some of them, um, but, yeah, I'm I, I, in a way, I'm kind of like you two. I get frustrated easily mm -hmm. because I sit down and go, okay, logically this should work, and it doesn't. And then I'm like, I don't know what else to try. Logically, that is the thing that should work. Right. So. Um, in video games, it's different, but, you know, in a actual tabletop setting, it's like, yeah, boring. It didn't work? All right, let's do something else. <laughs> you know? Yep. And then, of course, uh, we mentioned this one when we were talking to Buddy about favorite game systems, but Expedition to Barrier Peaks. Mm. Where you... Josh, go you, back a long time. You go visit the Grand Duchy of Jeff, which I always loved. <laughs> um, and of course you did. He's, his, <laughs> his duchy is under attack from monsters that keep coming out of one particular cave, so he wants you to go in and find out where they're coming from and kill them all. And you get in there and find you you find stuff that your characters have absolutely no idea what in the world it is. It's weird metal golems and sliding doors and key cards made of some sort of stiff material that's not wood, but it's not metal. And and it it basically it's uh, a, a a down spacecraft that was from another prime material plane where they had space oh, stations. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it crashed and some sort of virus killed all of the people. But all of the artificial intelligence is still working. So all the robots are still working, the androids, um, all the high-tech devices are still there, and they they work within the confines of the station. But if you take them out they basically walk out of their power field and they don't work anymore. That was the that was the big thing for me was trying to figure out, you know, how do you get how do you deal with the fact that they have to you know, figure out that they can't take the stuff with them. Like they can't walk out of there and be wandering around the world with laser pistols. Um and there was a simple solution something that science has been talking about for a century or more broadcast power mm. and that's how that all worked and so while you were in the remains of the space station everything worked but you left the space station and you walked out of the power field and nothing functioned anymore I remember a couple players talking about, well, we're gonna do we're gonna do some some research and figure out how to power them with magic instead. And I'm like, so you're basically gonna create a wand? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, no, we're gonna make the laser pistol work. I said, yeah, you're gonna create a wand that shoots like sunbeam. Yep. You know, nah, it's not what we wanted. I'm like, well, uh, sorry. <laughs> Always trying to get away with something. Yep, munchkins. Um, did you ever play any of the stuff that was specifically written for Greyhawk? Well, uh, those early campaigns, I believe, were, were Greyhawk setting, weren't they? Those well, early modules? there wasn't any other setting, so yeah. 
right that was um, the game world but yeah other than that i don't think so once once forgotten realms came out uh into mainstream um i completely fell in love with the world yeah me too and i had never wanted to play in anything else <laughs> i still don't um, yeah well i tried to i tried to um i tried out of the uh insistence of another person to play Dragonlance once. Um, and I believe I was playing a cleric. And when I tried casting a spell, I couldn't uh, because of the convoluted spell casting um, dynamics of the world and i thought nope i'm out so See, that's weird i don't remember it affecting the clerics i thought it was only the wizards i don't know all i know is i tried casting a spell and because uh the moon wasn't at its epogee and wasn't uh eclipse and blah 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 and on and on and i was just like i do I or don't I have access to my spells? Well, you do, just only when this and this and this. Now, like, okay, no, bye bye. Yeah, that was Not the for me. that was the thing that discouraged me after trying Dragonlance too was just that whole moon phases thing. Yeah, I yeah, I'm not, you know, sticking my tongue out, standing on one foot, looking up at the moon and seeing if it's at the right color. And uh, no, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I love the world. I love the books. I think it's it's a fantastic uh, system. I'd love to see it. Uh, I'd love to see it redone for fifth edition, because they could make that moon phase thing so much easier. They just yeah. you know say okay you know if you're if you're uh, a, a red robe and you're a neutral cleric, if uh, the if that moon is less than half full and either of the other two is more than half full, you have disadvantage on your attack rolls. Well, if you ever do, they ever do that and you ever decide to run it, um, go to the moon, stand on it, give me proof that you were there, come back, and I might listen to your offer. Huh? I won't accept it, but I'll listen to it. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. will never play in Dragonlands again. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, the um the the one Greyhawk module that I played um I only bought because it was released for uh April Fools' Day one year. Hmm. It was an absolute lampoon module. Right? Um it was uh, a multi-part scenario consisting of 11 dungeon levels below Castle Greyhawk, um, including such illustrious names as Where the Random Monsters Roam and the Temple of Really Bad Dead Things. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yep, here's the, here's the thing. Uh, here's the table of contents. Level 1 was called Against the Little Guys. Level two was, it's my party and I'll die if I want to. Mm -hmm. Level three was the one I remember. It was called Too Many Cooks. And the sort of big bad was a meat golem. A meat golem. Yeah. Like, its head was a ham. And its arms were, like made of hard salami. It was a flesh golem, but it had been done with edible meats. Um, and a deli golem. Yeah, that's a very good way to look at it. It was a deli golem. Um, and and uh, they had, you know, characters like, they had um, Poppenfarsh, the doe golem, oh boy. who stood about this big mm -hmm. and went, whoo <laughs> right yeah um, 
But yeah, that's uh, some of the other ones. Um, there's no place like up. Um, <laughs> level nine, vices and virtues. Level 10, Fluffy Goes Down the Drain. Level 11 was called Mordenkainen's Movie Madness. Uh, okay. Yeah, and then the bottom level was Where the Random Monsters Roam. Mm. But I vaguely <laughs> remember, remember the movie level because... Um, it was something like Mordenkainen had created a spell that um, unreeled uh, a serial narrative in illusion form, and the spell had gotten away from him and had created sort of pocket realities. And in order to figure out how to save him and end the spell, you had to go into the pocket realities and gather stuff. So... You know, you had to wander into a monster movie. You had to wander into, you know, like a Keystone Cop style movie. You had to wander into, you know, like a, a, a mass uh, monster invasion type scenario. And it was interesting. Mm. But that was the fun stuff. Now, it, it's interesting that, you know... We, We've talked about so many of them, and all of them are like original D and D or first edition or second edition. Yes. Um, there's not a lot that I mean, apart from um, Throne of Bloodstone. Right. Um, but I was looking through like the third, and I just skipped the fourth because it's fourth. But looking through like the third edition modules and the fifth edition modules, and I really didn't find that many that I went, oh yeah, that one. And mm. I figured out why, because we were deep in the throes of writing our own stuff at that point. Yeah. You know, when third yep. edition came out, we sort of you know figured out the rules and then went, all right, so we're just going to yep. keep going on this adventure. We're just going to convert everything to third edition. <laughs> Um, but you know, there were a couple that, that sprang to mind. I mean, obviously return to the temple of elemental evil was one, um, the sunless citadel. Uh, that doesn't ring a bell. That was, uh, one of the big starter modules <clears throat> for third edition. Um, everybody well, no. was, Everybody started at first level in that one. Right. Third edition modules, didn't they uh, have the more of a campaign module where, you know, it took you from level one to, you know, some of them to level 20. You know, if you played through the whole thing, it would just take you through the whole. There were, the a, whole... There were a couple. That's really more of a fourth and fifth oh, okay. thing. Um yeah, I don't know. Like I said, after after second edition, I don't know that I played through any modules. So, yeah, um, they came out with um, a sequel to um, the Demon Web Pits in third edition, right? As part of Planescape, called Exp Expedition to the Demon Web Web Pits. And basically, uh, it's uh, you end up having to go to sort of help um, Lolf because there's a worse demon trying to take her spot. And so you have mm. to go and... Uh, convince where is his name I can never pronounce it Corallon Larathian one of the elven deities you have to convince him to help um, yeah. yeah it's yeah that's that's it, a 
monumental task. Yeah, it, <laughs> it was pretty convoluted. Um, I remember reading it. I never got to try and run it, but I read it. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's the 5th edition stuff. And like I said, I've only... I've only run part of one and read through a bunch of another. So I've I've run part of Out of the Abyss. Mm. That was the one where you get kidnapped by Drow. And the first thing you have to do is break out of the holding pen and there's all those other creatures in there with you. And I remember mm. something about uh, meeting up with a couple goblins who were web runners and enlisting their help in getting across this massive webbed chasm that was thousands of feet across. And I don't think we got much further than that. But there was the little um, there was the little myconoid like the myconoid child that would puff spores at you when it wanted to talk to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. It got, you know, that the reception to that one was pretty good. You know, people were like, hey, this, <clears throat> this is exactly what we're looking for because it was, it was written so that you could start at level one and by the time you finished the entire book, you would be level 15. So, right. and then of course, you know, Dungeon of the Mad Mage, which I devoured like a novel, <laughs> but never had a chance to do anything with. Yeah. So I'm, I'm looking here at the, all of the fifth edition modules that they have listed. There's a lot that they've come out with. And, and these aren't, like the little paper module, these are like big books. Uh, they have the new Baldur's Gate, Dissension into Avernus. Oh. Or Avernus. Avernus, I think. Yeah. Of course, Curse of Strahd, uh, Divine Contention, Dragon of Ice Spire Peak. Uh, yeah, well, and then this one, Dra Dungeons and Dragons versus Rick and Morty. Yeah. I guess that's the thing. Too old. Uh, well, but yeah, there's a whole handful of them here. Um, Rick and Lord Morty's Rick and Morty's a lot of fun. I love Rick and Morty, but I can't see how that would work. I've never looked at it. Um, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. Oh, that's the new one that came out. That was the other one that I was interested in. Was Tales from the Yawning Portal. Oh, okay. Because if I remember right, that was like a planescape ish. Mm hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Waterdeep Dragon Heist, Tomb of Annihilation. Yeah, they're. Uh, they got oh. some. Sorry. I just remembered what Tales from the Awning Portal was. Oh. <laughs> it was the fifth edition port of a bunch of classic modules. Sunless Citadel, Forge of Fury, Hidden Shrine of uh, Tamawashan, White Plume Mountain, Dead in Thay, Against the Giants, and Tomb of Horrors. All ported up to 5th edition. Okay. I remember I got that for Christmas one year. Rise of Tiamat, in case you really want to kick some players around. Right. Right. <laughs> and, oh yes, Tomb of Annihilation. Tomb of Horrors needed a sequel. Right. <laughs> Never even thought of peering at that one past the, the cover. Right. I just looked and went, nope. <laughs> nope. Still yeah, have there doesn't need to be a lynching of the DM. Right. Still have nightmares from the first one. Nope. Um, oh yeah, and they have they have Curse of Strahd. Yes. So they have that one. they have uh, the Ravenloft in fifth. 
But the great thing about these is that they have so many um, extra resources in them that you can use in any campaign or anything you got going. It's just really cool. Yeah. You know, so it's not just, oh, it's just this module and that's the only thing you can get out of it. It's actually got quite a bit of stuff in it. Yeah, which is smart marketing-wise because then you get the oh. people who want to buy it because of the extras, even if they don't plan on running it. They want access to the to the new material. Right, which is precisely why I got the Icewind Dale because it's got a bunch of content in it. Um, I don't know that I ever plan on, you know, because I got my own world. Uh, I don't really plan on running Icewind Dale. I guess I could maybe, you know, adapt it to fit into my world, but um, sure. uh, maybe I will one day. But, uh, yeah, it's just got a lot of cool stuff in it. So it was the same thing with getting uh, uh, some of the source books I got. You know, the that latest one I got was uh, um, the Wild Mount book. Critical Role. Oh, yeah. Uh, Because there's a lot of cool stuff in that. The Dudamancy stuff, it just fascinates me. Yeah. Yeah, I have have something. I have a a new system that's going to make its appearance eventually in a Cathan. Like uh, something, something, something new and different that, yeah. And I finally came up with a good name for it, too, so I'm happy. <laughs> as long as it doesn't kill us. Uh, yeah, well, it, let's put it this way. You're not going to see it until after about 12th level. Okay, good. Because <laughs> I figured that's about where you need to get before it's not instantly lethal. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like these th- this group that we've got going. I don't want to see any of them, you know, die. Snuff out before it's time before the time. Yeah, and yeah, then I, I, we've got the new the new book coming, the Tasha's book. Uh huh. That one, I'll admit, I'm curious. Yes, I will be getting that one as well. I mm-hmm. may think about it if you get it on <laughs> D&D Beyond then at least I'll be able to look through it right? and decide if I want to add it or not but yeah so there you go that's that's kind of a retrospective of the best ofs uh, well, as far as our perspective of it anyway yeah of course, now I really want to go pull out Pharaoh and start working on that 5th edition port. <laughs> really wish I hadn't thought of that. Well, we're kind of going to start doing that with our little campaign, aren't we? Yeah, well, not really. Uh, no. Hopefully you're not actually going into the desert. That would be bad. Okay, good. I was kind of wondering if that's where we were headed, and I'm glad we're not. <laughs> not yet. Okay. Not yet. That too is uh, is uh, an eventuality that, if it comes to pass, will be at significantly higher levels. Right. Why do I get images of Dune in my head? I don't know. <laughs> that trailer looks amazing. Yeah. And that the the sandworm at the end. I was just kind of like, oh wow, that's kind of how I pictured it in my head all these years. Mm, well. The way they have CGI these days, I'm sure it's a phenomenal to see. <laughs> it absolutely is. It's about how I envision uh, like a fully grown purple worm. Because mm. they're fun. It's fucking massive. Mm-hmm. Like, based on the scale that they showed, it's probably... It's it's a I'm gonna guess somewhere between 120 and 140 feet in diameter, and who knows how long it is. That's a big worm. Yep, and all around the inside of the mouth are teeth that have got to be like 10 to 15 feet long. Neat. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. Not neat. Terrifying. So, no, not really planning on putting anything like that in the desert. Right. There's enough. Well, there. there's enough in the desert to worry the about. Clubhouse wall, wall, Jeff. Yeah. There's not enough time. No. Not when two nerds sit down and talk D and D. There's usually not. No. And there's there's not enough time to play all those cool modules either. <laughs> no. No. Clock's ticking. Because you know, <laughs> now I'm immediate. I'm already thinking. You know, hmm, the Bloodstone campaign, fifth edition rules. I've considered that. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah, well, you have your plate full right now, so. Yeah, I know. With a Cathan and rewriting Pharaoh, I'm going to be busy. Yeah, in all of our other content. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not rewriting Pharaoh again. <laughs> if I keep telling myself that, maybe I, I won't do it. You will. Yeah, probably. I'll get bored and start in on it and then be like, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, hopefully this has been at least uh, moderately entertaining. Um, if nothing else... Uh, if you don't know about some of the older modules, it's worth going to take a look at them. A lot of them you can find online now if you do a Google yeah. search for them. You know, and the other thing is if you're a, a brand new DM and, and you're trying to figure out how to get started, these are excellent tools to kind of give you an idea because that's how we learned. That's how we got our start doing it. Uh, they're really good for learning how to put together and structure a campaign and, and uh, uh, you know, a good, like you called it, a template for it. Yep. Just remember, if you're looking at the older modules, they were templates for just straight hack and slash modules with just a modicum of story. Right. So yeah, if, you're, just... if you're looking for something a little bit more RP intensive, you're going to need to sort of write that into it if you plan on using one of them. Right. Again, which is good practice. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of the best ways, I think, to learn is to take something that's already established and modify it to suit yourself, to suit your yeah. particular campaign style. Right. And, and what you're comfortable and have the most fun playing. Right, and then you can sort of see, you know, okay, well, how do I blend all the fighting with all of the role-playing, and where does the story come in, and how does it get introduced, and how does it develop? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes the story develops through combat. Yeah. So, you know, don't shy away from that. But just remember, the old modules were pretty much nothing but combat you know and the thing to remember i know that a lot of times the the dungeon crawl murder hobo kind of gets talked about almost derogatorily anymore but the, the fact is the fact is is it can be fun yes it's a lot yes. of fun to just go in and roll dice and kill monsters yeah um you know so don't like you said don't discount it don't write it off because uh, you can have a lot of fun doing that, too. Um, There's one thing that happens in a, a combat-intensive dungeon is that party cohesion happens much more quickly because you are facing constant threat after threat after threat, and you have to pull together or you die. Yeah. Yeah. So I've if never you... tried a dungeon crawl with 5th uh, edition before because that... That would cause you would really have to do some work to con to um, conserve you know your your stuff because you can't be throwing healing spells all over the place. You can't be throwing you know lightning bolt all the time. It, it's not that's not how it works in fifth edition. Right. So that would be an interesting uh, way to to do it. The, you know, the economy of, of your character and how, how to do things. Well, you, we're going to see how that works out. Um, one of the uh, possible routes you could take uh, 
probably <clears throat> oh let's see based on how we've been going so far probably towards the end of the year uh, mm. you might have gotten to the point where you could take one of the hooks that would actually lead you to a an old fashioned dungeon crawl mm. already written it would be interesting yeah so. Glad I'm not the magic user. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Well, like I said, hopefully uh, you learn uh, a little bit anyway. Um, you know, if you're and, and like I said, if if you're looking for something to use as a template, uh, check out Pharaoh. Check out i3. Um, written by two people who are very creative and very good storytellers. And it's got some very interesting uh, trap mechanics in it that yep. I think you'll enjoy. So, all right. Well, uh, that pretty much concludes the programming for the week here, except on YouTube on Saturday. Yes. Um, me and Pam will be uh, dropping our reaction video to uh, some sci-fi movies that we uh, have never seen before and um, some movies that are considered uh, iconic. And the one we started with was the master one itself, uh, Metropolis, which will drop on Saturday. Um, and you'll get to see our reaction to it. And uh, it was a really fun movie. Um, but I'll let you watch that, uh, watching us watching it. But, uh, yeah, should drop Saturday. It'll be a, be kind of fun. And then uh, Sunday we start off uh, the next week of Suffs. Uh, Sunday, bored remotely, we're back in World of Warcraft. I'm, I'm trying to learn as much as I can. Um, I actually hit top level for the... Uh, expansions that I have. I have a, a, a 110th level wizard. Um, Alrighty then. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well, I've been seeing this other class running around while I've been leveling this character. I'm going to try that class now. So at the moment, I have a 40th level druid. And uh, I'm liking... I'm liking the 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 shape shifting abilities of the druid. That's mm. that's a lot of fun. And then uh, Monday night will be uh, player chat with uh, Nikki and Pam. And then Tuesday night will mm. be the fifteenth episode of Lands of Acathen. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. How did we get Good there? Times. Yep. Good times. And well, when you do it once a week like we used to, it goes by pretty quick. <laughs> yep. Yep. This is the first campaign that I've run steadily on a weekly basis in, oh, God, 25 years. Yeah. So. Long time. Long time. And then we'll be back next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Those are uh, U.S. time for uh, another episode of GM Chat. Yep. So have a great weekend and uh, do something fun. Stay safe, stay sane, and uh, find Pharaoh. Yeah. And hit us up on our social media, please. Absolutely. Uh, artifactsworldswide.com. You can see them all up on the screen right there. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, if you have a favorite module that we didn't mention, let us know. Because oh, yeah. we don't know all of them. <laughs> no, no, no. And uh, if we missed a good one, we'd appreciate finding out. Yeah, yeah. Give us a give us a like. Uh, you know, subscribe to our channel and uh, yeah, shoot us a message and, and say hey. Know what's up. Yeah, check it. Check this one out. Yep. So, all right. Until next week. Take it easy, everybody. See ya.